Uh, the meeting of the MAG Active Transportation Committee is now called to order. Jason, do we please, I'm sorry, Jason, will you please take roll call? Sure, I'll do the roll call for the um, Active Transportation Committee. <clears throat> Hezekiah Allen. Hezekiah? Grant Anderson. Here. Bob Bean. Bob Bean. Um, Ryan Wozniak. Ryan. Stacy Bridge Denzik. Stacy. Marielle Brown. Here. Thank you. Stephen Chang. Stephen. Susan Conclu. Here. Jason Crampton. I'm here. Thank you. Stephen Esther. Stephen, I believe I saw his name. Um, Brand uh, Brandon cannot make today. Tiffany Halperin. Tiffany. Tara Harmon. Tara? Present. Thank you. Jason Harris. Here. Thank you. Jim Johansson. Jim. Jeff King. Here. Thank you. Larry Kirch. Larry. Ashley Knudsen Glendale. Donna Lewandowski. Donna. Uh, Jose is here. Here. Jessica May. Jessica. Here. Thank you. Here. Christine McMurdy. Here. Thank you. Omar Peters. Here. Thank you. Woodrow Scouten. Woodrow. Ward Stanford. Ward. Garrett. Here. Thank you. Justin. Weldy, Town of Fountain Hills. Present. Thank you, sir. Nathan Williams. Nathan, thank you. Um, Randy Proach? Yeah. Okay. City of Buckeye, Randy Proach. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. And Robert Yabes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's for the Active Transportation Committee. Thank you, Jason. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and call the transit committee to order. Kara, would you go ahead and take roll call for the transit committee? Certainly, Chair Crampton. Um, so starting at the top, I understand we have a lot of overlapping members, so just bear with us. All right, I'm gonna see if I can grab Kara. It looks, sounds like her sound is down. Just give me one second. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, starting at the top, Jill Dusenberry. Christabel? Here. Thank you. Sean Banda. Jose. Here. Thank you. Benjamin. Here. Thank you. Dawn. Um, Nathan. I'm here. Thanks, Nathan. Kevin. Here. Thank you. Christine. I'm here. Thank you, Christine. Reed. I'm here. Thanks. Um, Ed standing in for Jody. Present. Thank you, Ed. Kathy. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Jesus. Present. Thanks. Tara. Present. Thank you, Heather. Present. Thank you. Uh, Salvatore. Here. Thanks. Ratna. 
Yep. Thank you, Kristen. Eric. I'm here. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, Carol. Here. Thank you, Grant. Here. And Chair Crampton. I'm here. I just saw you, I know you're here. Um, thanks, Chair Crampton. We do have a quorum present. Thank you, Kara. Uh, thank you, Jason and Kara for a roll call. Uh, let's move on to the next item, which is call to the public. Uh, please remember to unmute yourself when speaking so that everyone can hear you. Uh, members of the public were invited to submit written comments relating to this meeting at the azmag.gov slash comments within one hour of the posted start time for the meeting. Mag staff, do we, do we, did we receive any comments? Um, thank you. We have not received any comments for this item or any other item on today's agenda. Uh, thank you, Kara. All right, uh, moving on to item number two, the Transportation Planning Program Manager's greeting. Uh, we have Audra Thomas from MAG Transportation Planning Program Manager will provide a uh, few announcements and introduce today's agenda. Thank you so much, Sharon Macias. Uh, members of our Active Transportation and Transit Committees, pleased to be with you today to have our fourth, maybe, um, joint meeting of these two important committees at MAG. Uh, tradition started four or five years ago that we feel strongly about recognizing the interconnectedness of our collective work. Uh, all, all folks on transit start out as pedestrians, right? And we feel strongly about the multimodalness of this work and have dedicated one meeting a year uh, to bring presenters and discuss topics of mutual interest. I will first start uh, with a few announcements from MAG uh, before introducing our speakers today. I'd first like to acknowledge that for those of you focused on active transportation, the deadline for fiscal year 2022 design assistance applications through our online portal is July 30th. If you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to Jason Stevens. Also, as is often customary, uh, we are anticipating the cancellation of the July meetings of both Active Transportation and Transit Committee. Um, it is typically a dead month for us and we anticipate cancellation of both of these committees in July and you'll see those cancellations forthcoming. And then just uh, on behalf of our entire planning team at MAG, I want to acknowledge and thank you for your partnership. As you know, our, our keen focus these last several months um, and particularly the last several weeks have been on the final stages of development of a regional transportation plan to inform the extension of Proposition 400. Our team's been very busy and really want to extend our appreciation for your partnership, um, gratitude for your patience if we haven't been as responsive as we normally have, but uh, really just want to express our appreciation for our member agencies and being partners in this important work um, and, and hope to really come out of this summer with a consensus plan in the upcoming weeks. Um, with that, Chairman, that completes my high-level announcements. I'm happy to take any questions after the meeting if there is interest. Uh, thank you, Audra. And if anybody has any questions, please contact the uh, MAG staff after the meeting. All right, uh, let's move on to item number three, which is the complete streets post-COVID. Uh, we have a presentation today. We have Dave, um, I hope I'm saying your name right, Dave Ederer. A PhD, a PhD, uh, PhD graduate in transportation systems engineering from Georgia Tech has joined us today to provide us a presentation on a, a complete street design post COVID. This item is for information and discussion. So please hold all your questions to the end of the uh, presentation. So Dave, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, so my screen should be up. Is, is everybody seeing that okay? Great, so thanks so much for inviting me today. I'm really excited to uh, speak with this committee and talk a little bit about public health and complete streets and, and COVID-19. Um, and you said my name perfectly, Dave Etter. Uh, just finished my PhD at Georgia Tech. Um, and 
I'm actually starting at CDC in the Epidemic Intelligence Service in about two weeks. I actually um, will be joining the division that does Active People Healthy Nation. I saw this on uh, your, your committee's website, at least on the Active Transportation Committee's website. So it's kind of cool to, to be able to join this group. And I love that you combine or have these joint meetings between transit and active transportation, because it's really two sides of the same coin. Um, and really, what I'm going to talk about today is that I don't have a crystal ball about what mobility will look like uh, after the pandemic, but I did want to highlight um, some fundamentals about what complete streets are and how they relate to um, Vision Zero or the safe systems approach, because I think those are really key uh, transportation ideas, but they're actually founded in, in, in ideas that generated on the side of, uh, or from public health. Um, and hopefully by the end of this presentation, I can convince you that you're all public health professionals and talk a little bit about um, all the great work you do. And obviously you understand the importance of transportation to health in terms of safety, but also in terms of physical activity and uh, you know, reducing particulate matter. Uh, but first, I, I actually wanna start here. I doubt anybody knows who this is, but this is actually a guy named Mark Hollis. And he was the first director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or as we call it, CDC. This is before they even called it CDC. Um, he's one of two non-physicians that have ever led CDC, and he happens to be a civil engineer. And civil engineers and transportation planners actually have a long history in public health that we've kind of forgotten about. Um, I think a lot of planners understand your shared origins with public health. But uh, uh, we engineers, and I say this um, as an engineer, we, we forget our role in public health in that we, we have been part, we have been public health professionals since the very beginnings of public health. So if you know the story of Jon Snow, the Broad Street Pump, that's how epidemiology was invented. Uh, he was a physician who identified a cholera outbreak, but that cholera outbreak required collaboration with engineers. A guy named Joseph Baselgate actually solved the outbreak by rebuilding the water system in London. And I kind of see that as, um, how things work in transportation. A lot of public health folks quantify the burden of injuries and it's our job as planners and engineers or whatever you might be to help fix those problems. Um, and if you look at how they define public health engineering way back in the 30s, they say the prime object of public health engineering is to control the factors of the physical environment as they especially affect the health and welfare of aggregates of people. Really sounds like what we do in transportation. And if you took a civil engineering curriculum, it's pretty similar to what uh, public health engineers were taking in the 30s. And if you look at this old curriculum from 1931, they proposed an entire two years or, or two semesters of, of transportation systems engineering. Uh, and it's pretty similar to the, the curriculum that we have for our uh, civil engineers at Georgia Tech. Um, so, so why do I say all this? Uh, what public health is really good about is understanding cause and effect. And so as a public health engineer, public health planner, whatever you might be, and I think anyone on this call qualifies, it's not so important that the public health engineer or planner knows how to build a sewer, that they know why sewers are necessary and what results may be anticipated from the discharge of their contents uh, without treatment into a body of water. You could just simply replace that language in there with something related to transportation. It's important to understand um, not just how to build a road or how to plan a road system, but understand what happens when we make certain decisions about the form of the roadway, how we want it to function, right? So I, I do a lot of research on safety. I think that's critical in terms of active transportation and also in terms of uh, public transit. I think public transit or public transit is the safest transportation um, when we look at it in a couple of different ways. Um, but I think public health folks think about safety a little differently. Than we do in transportation. So typically in transportation, we have an ease framework and we say education, enforcement, and engineering lead to fewer crashes, all true, but there are never enough ease. So we keep adding more, right? Evaluation, emergency response, equity. There's a paper I read where it goes to something like 20 different ease. And we keep adding these ease, but it doesn't actually say anything about cause and effect and how we can intervene to make uh, our, our roadway system function the way we want it to. All these E's are really, really important and they're really useful. It looks like we lost David. Yeah, let's give him a minute. I can 
I can text them and see what's going on. Okay. Also, I, I was not able to see his slides. I just see David. Hi, Keith. Uh, you know, I think from my end, I can see the slides. Anyone else having trouble with the slides? No issues with seeing the slide or the presenter on my side. Keith, you might check your view and which selection you've had. You might have him pinned as a as the individual. I went through all the views I could. Uh, that's good. We'll take one moment here. Appreciate all of your patience um, as we attempt to reconnect. David Worley, were you sharing the slides or um, did we completely lose that connection? He was sharing his slides. I have uh, I have the PowerPoint with the next presenter slides, but I don't have his in that PowerPoint. Okay. Um, I can, I think we have him available. If, if he wants to try to join by phone, we can probably get that information to him. Um, Kara, where we stand, have you been able to reach him? Not yet, and what I might propose is that we move to the next presentation and see if I can work on the back end to get him reconnected. I think that's a great idea. Uh, Mr. Sinclair, are you willing to step up and uh, come in a little prematurely with your presentation and see if we can reconnect later? Uh, sure, let's give it a try. Thank you. Welcome, thank you so much for being here. All right, well, let's go ahead and uh, uh, we'll come back to Dave. Let's go up to uh, item number four on the agenda, the designing transit for pedestrian safety. And like Audra said, we have Keith Sinclair from the Federal Highway Administration, a senior safety engineer, uh, to present on um, transit for pedestrian uh, friendly. I'm sorry, uh, transit for pedestrian safety. Uh, this is a uh, for information and discussion only. Uh, so uh, Keith, go ahead and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, again, I'm not seeing any slides or anything. I just see the last speaker's screen. So I'm not sure what you all are seeing. Uh, uh, we're seeing your presentation. Oh, wow. Okay, well, we'll try this in the blind. This, again, Keith Sinclair from the Federal Highway Administration. Um, happy to follow a fellow Georgia Tech alum, Dave there. Uh, but come here today to, to talk to you about uh, the, the combination of merging of our common needs between pedestrian safety and transit access. Um, so we can go to the next slide, which would be general considerations for transit accessibility. And go to the next slide where, we, where you will see connecting people to transit. And as you can see from this slide, from our sister agency, from the FTA, we have a, um, a joint goal of improving the connections between all modes of travel, including transit and pedestrians uh, and cyclists for that matter. Um, going along with the, the theme from the previous presentation of complete streets, we wanna make sure that all of our modes of transportation are able to, co uh, to cohabitate well together and to connect amongst the, each other. Um, next slide. So our joint goal is to move people safely and efficiently through our systems, uh, regardless of your, of, of your chosen mode. And, and so 
We really want to have a good synergy uh, between those who are walking, those who are biking, and those who are choosing public transportation. Uh, and we can go to the next slide. And, and when, we, when we have those goals, we have a number of uh, competing needs, excuse me. Uh, chief among those competing needs or, or what comes into play is, is uh, how our various users uh, are interacting in our systems and some of those common needs from the system uh, listed here on the slides are, are a number of them, a number of them. Um, but chief, some primary concern areas are, are of course, crashes uh, in terms of uh, pedestrian crashes as they're trying to make their way to the transit system in the first mile and last mile, uh, so to speak. And we wanna make sure that we are designing our pedestrian access and our transit access in such a way uh, that we can foster safe movements. Uh, we have to look at uh, the various stop placements, uh, access to those stops, uh, the, the sidewalk environment uh, in association with the stop itself. Uh, the type of mode of transit uh, uh, comes into play and, and with the design of those stops, I'll show in a little bit coming up. What type of information we're providing to our patrons on their way to the transit uh, stop and at the transit stop themselves. So we have to have some good wayfinding and then we have to have some good information on the transit routes when we get to the stops. And of course, whenever we're doing any type of operations or maintenance, with various uh, modes, either be it the uh, trans pedestrian access to the station or the stop or at the stop the station itself. During those maintenance operations, those construction operations, we need to still maintain uh, good, safe, efficient access to our facilities. So. Next slide. And I'm just checking in that the slide should uh, uh, say agency considerations, correct? Sure does. All righty, thank you. So with our agency considerations, of course the transit stops themselves, be it a stop or a station, are controlled and operated by the transit authority. Access to or connecting to the outside roadway network, usually controlled by the owners, which can we'll generically call a DOT for this discussion here. And we, we need to have good synergy between those two agencies and, and others so that we can move our, our patrons uh, seamlessly between the modes. Um, and when we're trying to foster those better connections and, and get that going, we can look at our whole system and on a higher level and look down at it, so let's say for high use locations, we may, may want to look over our, our entire corridor, look at those locations where we're having a lot of uh, uh, patrons, either where we have a stop with a lot of uh, riders, we have a, a station with a lot of routes, we have land use surrounding that area that generates a lot of pedestrian and a lot of use. And we, we can look all over our entire network there and pare it down and, and try to ascertain based upon the, the high ridership, high desirability for those routes and the, the amount of walking and pedestrians and cycling that we're generating from that, we can then look at our infrastructure and determine well, what, where we have some needs, where we have some gaps. Uh, we have a lot of people wanting to walk to this location. Do we have good facilities to get them to the, the bus stop itself? Uh, is there a good connection between the bus stop and our walking modes. Um, and always keeping in mind uh, that we want to be able to serve all of our modes in, in our corridor at all times, but what, the, what that will look like will not be the same in all locations. All modes will not be treated equally at every location, but we will have some treatments for all modes. Um, here and the, the ability to combine all these sources of information and all the all these sources of needs all this data gathering uh, and identifying 
the overall higher needs based upon our high ridership. Um, look at some locations. We have high riderships. We have good crossings, good pedestrian connectivity at that location. Uh, is, are we having areas of high um, occurrence of pedestrian crashes or incidents lo located by? And maybe overlap all of those and we can use that data to prioritize where we're gonna focus our efforts and funding uh, to improve our connections. Uh, we have a location with a lot of uh, demand. Uh, we have some missing gaps in our pedestrian access to our demand area. This might be where we want to focus some of our funding uh, initially. And we want to go to the next slide. And yeah, depending upon the mode of transit we're talking about, its catchment area uh, will vary for our pedestrians and cyclists. Um, for, for bus tra transit, yeah, as seen on the slide, you know, people are willing to walk up to a half a mile to, to get to a stop. For higher or, or more dense uh, transit modes, people will travel a longer distance, either by uh, walking or cycling. Or in, and then for, of course, for heavy rail, you get a lot of driving to them. But at why this is important is that we not only look at the stop or the station itself, in terms of its connectivity to, to the unit, to our walking environment, but also the surrounding areas. If we're, if we're drawing people in uh, from a mile away, a half a mile and a half away, we need to look at that and maybe improve some of those uh, facilities so that we can efficiently and safely get our pedestrians uh, and our, our patrons to this transit stop. One thing I, I, I say often in our designing for pedestrian safety uh, one-on-one -on -one workshop and, and in terms of transit is wherever we have a stop, we have a crossing. And that's because people are not willing to walk or travel too far away from the transit stop in order to get across the roadway. Uh, so we need to make sure we locate our, our transit stops or design our transit stops in our stations with that in mind, that we have good sight lines, um, we're meeting driver expectancy, um, and, and that people can safely get across the roadway for uh, at a transit stop. Because if you come in one, you get off on one side of the street at some point during your travel, you don't want to go back home or go back to any other direction. So you have to go on to the other side of the street. Uh, next slide. And the catchment area will, and, and the features associated with that, uh, that area will, will vary depending upon the context of the roadway and the context of the land use surrounding it. And as you see on this slide, in the top right, we have a, a fairly highly urban uh, location, big wide sidewalk, uh, good pedestrian access, good pedestrian features along there. And uh, contrast that with the slide on the bottom left, and you see more of a suburban area uh, with more narrow sidewalks, still have some connectivity. Both of these locations are located uh, uh, common to the same transit stop. It's just as you walk uh, away from that transit stop, land use changes, so our features will change. And we need to make sure that even with our features changing, we maintain that connectivity and get our pedestrians safely to the transit stop. Next slide. Again, checking. We are now looking at uh, common pedestrian safety issues. Yes, sir. Thank you. And uh, in terms of connect continuity and connectivity, uh, from a higher order policy level, we need to think of how are we going to get our, how do our pedestrians fit into our system and into our transit network? What type of system are we uh, trying to deploy to meet our constituents' needs? Is it a rapid transit? Is it a neighborhood transit? Uh, things of that nature. Uh, in terms of the, the, the stop or platform itself, uh, in terms of its location, where we're locating it uh, within the, the land use, are we meeting origin and destination goals? Um, and then design, are we, again, connecting it properly to our, our sidewalk network? Do we have easy access uh, to our stop? And uh, 
are we making sure that we're, we're having accessibility to our stations uh, and accessibility, not only in terms of those with disabilities, but accessibilities in terms of, of modes. Are we able to, to do any transfer modes uh, fairly easily in this area? And um, have we made accommodations for that? Uh, and as always, making sure our crossings are uh, thought of in terms of where we locate our station. Uh, next slide. And here for some con common transit conflicts. Um, just what I want, want to convey here is that there are design solutions that we can employ uh, to meet any issues that, that, that can arise depending upon the actual stop location, uh, station location and design. Um, not every street can, as I mentioned, serve every mode equally, but we can make sure that every mode gets served. Um, and, 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 and well, I'll talk more about that coming up. Uh, one, one, one thing you can do also is to look towards your peers uh, across the country. Um, uh, one that comes to mind is, is uh, the LA Metro uh, plan uh, where LA Metro did a, did a, trans, a transit analysis uh, where they looked at the, uh, the active transit pursuits and developed a strategic plan targeting uh, its first and last mile and prioritized uh, their improvements based upon their high demand locations, uh, their, miss, their missing gaps and uh, their pedestrian desire lines. Um, they started doing this way back in 2014, but uh, it was well publicized. There are other peers out, out there to look towards also, uh, uh, Seattle metro area, Portland comes to mind, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, the DC metro area also. So. And the next slide, we should start talking about buses. And we can go even one more slide after that to bus topics. And, and it, we focus a lot on buses and, and uh, the workshops I do because bus is the primary, primary mode that's most common across the nation. Um, and we focus in on the bus stop types uh, that who uh, on a higher level, uh, making sure there's good coordination between the bus stop owner and the roadway owner, um, where we're locating those buses bus stops in terms of the routes, uh, number of routes being served at a particular bus stop and um, making sure all of that meshes so that we have good access to the stops. Uh, they meet pedestrian desires in terms of, uh, of origin and destinations, um, stop placement, uh, making sure that the stops are well lit for nighttime operations. And that's very important because in terms of pedestrian uh, crashes and fatalities. Uh, three quarters of our pedestrian fatalities occur at night, uh, while only a quarter of our pedestrian travel occurs at night. So we're having far more crashes and, and fatalities at night. So lighting up our stops, lighting up our shelters, things like that, making sure that we're um, not only meeting visibility needs so that uh, drivers can see pedestrians at stops and at crossings, but also that pedestrians feel safer and more secure uh, at a stop or, or, or a station. So, and um, in terms of complex and unfamiliar designs and signals, this usually comes into play when, when our stops are located close, closer to our intersection. And we may have some special accommodations at that signalized intersection to enhance our bus travel uh, so since maybe some prior, bus prioritization and things of that nature, but we also need to make sure that those uh, factor in or, or mesh in nicely with the pedestrian accommodations we have at that signalized intersection in case we have something going on like a, a leading pedestrian interval or, or a pedestrian scramble or something to that, to that effect. So next slide. Of course, uh, uh, bus siding depends upon a lot of uh, factors, including the type of uh, bus system we're having running or, or routes we have, number of routes we have there, uh, what type of community we're, we're servicing, 
but it, it's important to have a, a, a good feel for the, the sheer number of bus stops you have out there and the, sheer, and the quality of those stops, the features located at those stops and their connection to the roadway network and whether or not we need to do some improvements to those connections and those stops. Um, I did back in uh, 96 before the uh, Olympic games in Atlanta, did a lot of work with the, with the MARTA, a local transit authority in Atlanta, preparing for that. And one of the bigger projects was geolocating and visiting each of their bus stops in the metro area. And one of the first things we discovered is that MARTA had far more bus stops than they realized. Um, some had been abandoned over years. Um, and, and we went through an exercise of consolidating them and then uh, adding in some ITS to provide some information on, on upcoming buses. All that to say is, you, you know, you have a sheer huge network out there. I know it's hard to keep uh, updated on the quality of your stops, uh, but in, in, as part of your ongoing or normal routine maintenance, um, I re highly recommend keeping some type of database on the quality of your stop and what features you have at your stops and go through a periodic exercise of consolidating when you can. Uh, and, and that goes, again, plays into the catchment area and, and the type of, of routes we have going on. If we have a stop that's going to have uh, multiple routes and we're going to do some transfers, then the design of that stop is going to be a little bit more robust uh, than a, you know, a one route stop that's going to see a bus every hour or so. So things like that. Of course, access to um, any associated parking or other facilities with your transit stop or your station also comes into play in terms of siting your bus stops. Uh, and there are a host of a lot of resources we rely upon or we recommend a lot of them. Uh, one of the one is, is, is uh, TCRP, uh, Transit Cooperative Research Report number 19. And you can Google that and get it. A lot of information uh, available from there. Uh, the next slide shows some, uh, some pictures of some common bus stop issues. And one, th one main thing you can take away from these pictures is uh, where you locate your bus stop is, is important. Uh, as shown in these photos, uh, there's sort of a mid-block bus stop, fosters some mid-block crossings for our, our pedestrians once they get off of the bus. So we need to make sure uh, that we provide some good features uh, at the stop and close to the stop to foster that um, mid-black crossing. Okay. And next slide, and we should be on slide bus stop design, correct? Correct. Yes, okay. And the design of the stop and the shelter, of course, needs to be accessible. Um, the amenities need to be placed in such a way that they don't block any of the sight lines uh, from, from drivers uh, on the roadway, seeing patrons at the bus stop, uh, blocking any of the sight lines for any associated crossings uh, located close to that cro uh, bus stop. And um, I know there's a tendency to uh, incorporate advertising in some way, shape, or some type of revenue ge generation at these shelters. Just make sure that they don't block any of the sight lines. So things like that. Uh, Next slide. We're going on to combining it all together. And this picture here shows a, a real nice location. Uh, we have a good accessible sh shelter. It's located in such a way and it's on a curb extension, so we're not blocking any sight lines. Um, the bus is able to pull up, unload, and load uh, without. Uh, leaving the travel lane so we won't have any uh, problems with the bus getting back into traffic. Uh, we have a good high visible crossing there, good pavement markings, good sight lines. This is a good example I wanted to show. Next slide. Main area caution. Again, making sure that we can get our patrons off of the bus and safely across the roadway, safely onto their destination. Um, and make sure that lo that location is well lit, well visible, and uh, 
we can get people across the roadway. How are we doing on time? I think we're probably like, you know, five minutes left, three to five okay. minutes left. And then we'll see where, uh, where we're at with the other presentation. That'd be great. All right, well, let's just go to the next slide. And I want to go to the next slide beyond that. When we start talking light rail, is that the slide we're showing? And we can go to the next slide saying light rail topics. And basically with light rail, all the uh, uh, same concerns as we would have at a, at a bus stop um, with some added complexities uh, surrounding the rail itself, uh, getting people safely a, a, across the rails, uh, either on foot, or in a wheelchair, or on a bike, making sure that there are no slipping and tripping hazards, um, making sure there's a good sight lines on the platforms, People can uh, see the oncoming train, train operators can see the oncoming uh, pedestrians and traffic, and we can try to avoid any possible uh, collisions that could result there. Um, we wanna make sure our crossings are aligned so that the track meets up with the, uh, either the pedestrian crossings, uh, the bike crossing or, or vehicle crossings at, at 90 degrees, um, minimizing these slipping uh, hazards as can possibly happen. And jumping ahead in my notes to about the next three, three slides, there will be a slide called light rail um, design considerations. Again, this is a great resource that was developed uh, that's available to you out there. And I know you're going to have copies of this slide. So uh, you'll be able to Google this and Lots of information, lots of research and, and uh, on common issues associated with uh, the alignment of, of the tracks, uh, uh, how to deal with the um, inherent speed differentials between uh, either motorized traffic, uh, bicycle traffic and pedestrian traffic as they're trying to get across uh, tracks and get to the stations themselves, uh, making sure that the uh, crossings are properly um, signed and marked and maybe if we're in an area with uh, either a large um, pedestrian demand and, and poor sight lines we might want to add some gates and, and beacons uh, to that crossing but in all cases all that needs to be accessible so uh, and i just want to you know what, at this point, if there are any questions, we can go to that because a lot of it is, uh, becomes somewhat repetitive um, in terms of the main consideration is connecting our, our systems so that as a, a pedestrian or a cyclist, or I can travel from the pedestrian network, the roadway network, to our transit network in a, a safe and sound manner. Um, and there are some inherent differences uh, depending upon the modes of travel, uh, of transit uh, that we can talk about if you have any specific questions. Um, and I, I'll leave it at that, Jason. Thank you, Chair, Chair, Jose, Chair Macias. All right. Uh... Thank you, uh, Keith, for that presentation. So let's go ahead and, and uh, before we move, we go back to the other presentation. Let's go ahead and open up uh, for questions from the membership. Do is there anybody and any members of the uh, MAG committees have any questions for Keith? Hey, this is Omar from uh, Valley Metro. Just go ahead, Omar. One question for Keith, just if you can talk a little bit more about, of course, funding is always an issue. Um, uh -huh. So maybe potentially um, using examples from across the country of how other regions are finding ways to fund both the studies to do this work and then all obviously actually going out and doing the work. If you can give some examples there of funding sources. Some good examples of funding, what I've seen from across the country um, with this more uh, 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 renewed emphasis or uh, on complete streets and pedestrian safety action plans. Uh, I've seen a lot of um, merging of efforts uh, between the normal uh, transit and 
pedestrian planning efforts and those efforts where we're evaluating our network uh, jointly and coming up with developing action plans and implementation plans um, to address any perceived shortcomings. Uh, and funding sources for that has, has been ranging from normal planning funds uh, to um, on, the, on the infrastructure side, some highway safety improvement program funds. Um, I've seen some locations tap into some uh, some bond uh, funding that they've done, local bonding. Um, but all of this is, is, is pretty much uh, eligible for a lot of the federal funding categories that we have. It's just that they can compete, compete uh, with other projects. So uh, making these projects as, as competitive as, as, pro as possible uh, by making, uh, by sort of um, joining forces uh, between active transport, transportation, transit, um, and in some cases, a safe for us to schools, uh, sort of layering those on, making it for a more compelling case. Uh, I'm not sure if that gets towards your overall question, Omar. Yeah, it's getting there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank uh, you. Appreciate there, it. And, and, you know, any future questions, feel free to reach out to me. You, you have Jeff there. Jeff King, uh, local, who can, who can help out a lot also. So. Thank you. All right, thank you, Keith. Uh, before we move on, any more other questions from the uh, the members? Jose? Yes. This is Margaret Hedetta. I'm the safety liaison to this. I'm MAG staff, but I'm safety liaison to this uh, committee. Um, I just wanted to kind of add something to, or in answer to Omar's question, MAG does have a um, roadway safety program um, funding source. Um, these are kind of for low cost um, immediate needs. So if there are some kind of um, improvements that Valley Metro would like to make, um, for instance, on some of the studies that we're doing with you, um, it, it could be potentially funded with, with that funding source as well. Um, thank you, Margaret. And uh, all right, well, thank you, uh, Keith, uh, for the presentation. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, again, if anybody has any questions, uh, please reach out to Keith and to our local rep here in the state. Um, Kara, where are we with, uh, with Dave? I'm, I'm here. Hi. Yeah, he's rejoined Sorry. us. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, so do you want to go ahead and get his presentation back up? I would love to. I'm so sorry about that. Um, an entire semester of teaching and I never got booted out. And then <laughs> but I guess you're just tempting fate at that point. So anyway, uh, right. I actually enjoyed being able to see Mr. Sinclair's presentation. I've, I've seen some of the resources from his group and I always, always like them. Um, and I'll try to incorporate some of the stuff from that. So anyway, uh, this is how we think through problems in public health and um, increasingly in transportation safety. So you can apply this same framework to transportation safety where, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I'm just gonna go right back into it, where we have humans interacting in the, in the environment with some kind of causative agent and in injuries, that, that's kinetic energy, right? We talk a lot about that in Complete Streets or Vision Zero about how kinetic energy is a problem and we need to plan around it, but what does that mean? Um, really, it's just a framework for thinking about how to break the triad. So we use things like seatbelts to dissipate energy over the body so that we don't have force hitting someone right in the chest, right? We can also have speed limits to change how people interact in the environment. And other things like vehicle design that dissipate energy throughout uh, uh, the course of a crash or prevent a crash from occurring. Um, this is very much part of Vision Zero, Safe Systems, Complete Streets philosophy. And you actually, when you look at this, it's a lot of public health language, a lot of public health thinking when we talk about um, complete streets or, or safe systems. It's not just about um, meeting or having every mode on one street. I liked, I liked how Mr. Sinclair mentioned that, that, that it's not having every mode in the street, it's making sure every mode gets served. Um, so you look at these public health words here. We, have, we go from preventing crashes to preventing injuries and deaths, um, designing the system to, to, to work for human beings, not just controlling speeding, that doesn't necessarily cause a crash or cause an injury, kinetic energy does, right? Um, and then shifting from the individual responsibility to the system level responsibility and thinking uh, proactively 
And I liked a lot of the things that Mr. Sinclair brought up about collecting data on different things, and we'll get to that later in my presentation here. Um, and so safe systems, complete streets, uh, you've probably heard a lot about it. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but um, what I really want to talk about is something that a lot of folks forget is that we have to align functional classification with design and speed. We have to think about how form and function can come in together to, to build complete streets, right? Um, the Swedes get a lot of credit for Vision Zero, but it's actually this part of this larger global effort that some people call safe systems, some people call complete streets. And like I said, there's two, two key points here, that homogeneity of mass and speed or direction, that's about thinking about the causative agent for safety, but also the functionality of roads. The Dutch are really good about this. They, they, um, they make it a key point as part of their um, design philosophy to have functional homogeneity. What does that mean? It means that you think about human behavior and you don't have competing functions on a street. And, and what do I mean by competing functions? Well, some, you might argue that uh, very high speed vehicles or maybe a truck route, a lot of kinetic energy there, right? That's a competing function with providing good pedestrian access, right? Or good transit access. And we have to think carefully when we mix those two functions. Um, the Dutch are very careful about it when you're mixing functions that are competing, uh, for example, modes that could uh, for pedestrian cyclist transit users who might be um, critically injured uh, by a high speed car, they, they separate them out um, in terms of usually grade separated, but also in, in, in space and time. Um, so I really like that idea of functional homogeneity, but it gets back to what, how should our streets function? What's the point? And frankly, it depends on how you who you ask, right? Uh, the business owner is going to have a different perspective than a commuter, who has a different perspective from a local resident, who has a different perspective than the transit operator, right? All of these people want the want the roadway system to function in a particular way, um, and, and it's always important to keep that in mind. <clears throat> and sometimes it's different than us, the people who are managing the system, <laughs> have different priorities occasionally. Uh, so this kind of gets back to how we've really defined function in the past. And this arterial roadway um, could be anywhere in the United States, I guess. I'm sure you, you all are familiar with a road that looks like this in, in your community. And if you look at it, there's all sorts of different functions there. You see a little transit stop, right? There's a bus stop, but there's also lots of commercial activity on the street. So you need to have access to all those different businesses. There's a, there's a housing complex down the road. You can't really see it in the picture. But then there's also clearly the overwhelming function here. Um, the overwhelming form here is to meet the function of moving vehicles at really high speeds, right? And I would argue that our classification or the fact that we don't think too much about what an arterial is, is, is harmful. And we don't, our road system doesn't function all that well. Um, when you look at it in, in, in different types of metrics, and the one I care about the most is, is safety. But this is a good example of competing functions on a roadway. Um, and how did we get there, right? We, we, we kind of just have this dichotomy between mobility and access, and they're kind of in tension with one another. Rather than thinking about how we can have functions that complement each other, like walking and transit. Um, so on one end of the spectrum, we, we have a priority on mobility. So high speeds, controlled access, very few access points. It's freeways, major arterials although I live on a major arterial, by the way. Um, and then the other end, you have access, where we have local streets, which in theory have lower speeds and increased access. Um, unfortunately, and, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, most of our trips occur on those mobility-centric streets, right, on our arterials. That's probably where there are a disproportionate number of crashes in your community. I know that's true in Atlanta. Most of our, our crashes, injuries, and deaths occur on arterials. And, and why is that? Because we're, we're trying to mush a bunch of different functions into this, this kind of uh, broadly defined roadway classification. Arterials tend to be where there's a lot of direct routes. It's where a lot of our buses operate, um, lots of commercial destinations, also where people work, live, like I said, literally live on an arterial. So this, I live this every day. Um, so one thing I think you can do, and I'll talk about some examples, is um, why not define function in terms of how and who uses the street? Uh, and this, you know, I notice 
all sounds very academic and theoretical, but uh, people are doing this in the field. And, and my favorite example, uh, my favorite recent example, I should say, is in Salt Lake City. Now this effort predated um, the COVID-19 pandemic where they were trying to define different street topologies. So not having a public engagement process based on one specific project, I'm sure we've all been there where there's a fight about uh, putting a new bus stop in or a bike lane or a sidewalk. Um, and, and we have lots of public engagement on that one specific project, but they've taken a step back and said, How, what do you want your streets to do? And it's been interesting because they've done this throughout the COVID-19 pandemic when people are kind of discovering new ways to, to, to use the public right of way. Um, and they got past this kind of uh, dichotomy between mobility and access and defined five functions of the public right of way, person mobility, greening, placemaking, curbside uses, and vehicle mobility. And, and so that person mobility really is the movement of people walking, um, using mobility devices, cycling. And I would argue transit fits in there too, um, my personal opinion. Uh, and so they asked people, you know, what's, what's your priority for each of these different functions? They overwhelmingly <laughs> said that um, person mobility was the most important thing. And they said this uh, should be the priority, whether it's near their home, near work, shopping, everywhere. So they, they, got, they kind of broke this, this chain of engagement where we're so focused on one specific project and really started to rethink about what the baseline should be. What should our, if, if people thought about the function of the street, what would it be? What's the status quo? Where do we start? And then you kind of have this starting point before you go into that project-based engagement about you know, how we're thinking on a systems level. And what I really liked is that they took those examples, they took those priorities that, that the community identified themselves and they created um, a basic uh, right-of-way design guidance. And there's all sorts of them. I, I include the link um, in the prior slide here. Oh in here that you can look at the, some of the different types. Um, and I'll, I'll follow up with notes as well. But this is just one example of an urban green street. And they have this really excellent specific guidance about what that street could look like. And they showed this to the public after they, the, the public identified what, um, how they wanted their roadways to function. And I think this is a really important point for the Complete Streets movement is that thinking about uh, Complete Streets and Vision Zero and uh, safe systems, all one and the same, is understanding that form and function should matter and that we need to ask about what we want our roads to do and then we define the form. I think we've started uh, on the other end so frequently. Um, Salt Lake City is not the only group to do this. There are state level agencies that are, that are thinking about this. And I want to clarify that this isn't replacing the uh, federal aid highway functional classification in any way. This is just another way of thinking about planning your system and getting input from the public. Um, and so this is from Florida DOT. There's another excellent guide, excellent resource. It's only about 30 pages. And you can see that they, they actually define the functional context based on the intended users. Um, and I, I really like this graph because it's really quick and easy to see how you know, an urban core arterial is very different than a rural town's arterial. And it has different needs, different function. And a lot of times you look at those arterials, they look very similar, right? And at least maybe in, in my experience here in Georgia and, and growing up in New York, um, sometimes you could just take a street, it could be downtown, it could be you know, out in the country somewhere. Um, and I think that's kind of leading with form and not function, lead with function and who you think will use the street. Other cities and metro areas are going through these processes. I know uh, Seattle and I think DC, I'm happy to provide another list of resources after the meeting. Um, but I think it all comes back to the data. And I think Mr. Sinclair really highlighted this well is thinking beyond simple counts, right? We, it, it's, we do a lot of counts because it can be automated, it's easy. And um, you know, we've, that's how we've always done it. But when you think about uh, a function, measure what matters, right? So go beyond just doing a simple pedestrian count or a count of the number of people riding a particular bus route and maybe look at um, trip generators in those areas. And I know you guys do all this stuff, but trip generators for walking or 
transit use and uh, continually monitor that and use that as a criteria for your design. And I'm not gonna go through all these, but I think this is a really nice table from that report from FDOT, looking at different types of data depending on um, the intended use. And I thought they did a really fabulous job um, laying out what uh, uh, you should you should measure if you know what depending on what what you're trying to do in the roadway. Um, and then just my last slide here, I wanted to conclude. I, I love this uh, project from from Europe to kind of pull together different projects around the world and 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 show how there's something going on in transportation. We all know this that people are rediscovering their streets and, and thinking differently about how uh, our, our roads can function. Um, I wish if there was a US example here of just putting all these different examples together, I would put it up there. But this is a ni another nice resource to go check out, and see what other cities are doing, how much money they're dedicating to these projects during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and just a last point, uh, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I have no idea what's gonna happen in terms of mobility after the pandemic. I do know that travel behavior is very sticky. It's very hard to change how people move, but I would encourage you to use some of those lessons you've learned in, in terms of public engagement, and being creative and getting, reaching out to people and using those lessons because uh, you know, you, all of you are gonna shape mobility after the pandemic. The virus is not going to shape mobility. It's going to be the people on the ground doing it. Um, and I'd encourage you to, to, to maybe rethink how you do your engagement and ask people what they want the roadways to do instead of saying, do you want this bike lane? Uh, maybe take a step back, engage in a planning process where you say, well, what's important to you in, in the roadway environment? Um, and how can, how can we build a road that meets that, 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 that priority for you? Um, like I said, I think Salt Lake City did a wonderful job doing that. There's a lot of other cities that are doing similar work, metro areas too, and states. Um, so I call it systems level engagement. So uh, I'll end there and I really appreciate your time. Um, it's always nice to talk with people who are doing stuff on the ground. Uh, and I hope, I hope you remember that you are public health professionals and uh, figure out how to incorporate that in your work. So thanks so much. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, Dave, um, let's go ahead and open up for questions from the uh, members. Do we have any questions for Dave? This is Christine. Can you hear me? Yes, Christine. Go ahead. Okay. Dave, thanks. I'm curious, and maybe I missed it. I apologize if I did, but what are your findings on the impacts of climate change to some of these um, situations that you've displayed in these slides? You know, I'm it's, it's, and I'm not asking this question because we haven't reached our high today of 116, we're only at 113 now, but um, we often talk about the challenge of creating walkable environments in, a, in a, a metropolitan area that is very, 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 very short on water. So landscaping is not often a solution. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out what's that comfort zone that um, you can actually invite uh, some of the folks that live in the valley to walk somewhere, to take their bike, to choose healthy transportation options, but then you get record-breaking heat and nobody really wants to go anywhere. So um, do you have anything you can share with us, anything uh, groundbreaking or um, direction that maybe other areas of the country that have unique climates um, have done that maybe is something we should take a closer look at? That's, that's an excellent question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I'll be frank, I don't have a, a good answer to that question because that is, that is a difficult <laughs> problem. It's okay, I didn't <laughs> expect one. <laughs> no, it's a super question and it's the sort of stuff we need to think about, right? Um, that only, this is, I don't think it's an answer to your question, but I mean, I, and I, you guys already know this, right? You're, you have a joint committee on this, like the, the bus, train, whatever it might be, the transit, walking, cycling connection is what makes everything work. Um, so my wife is Dutch, so I visit the Netherlands a lot and that's why I know a little bit about how they do things. Um, everybody talks about Dutch bike lanes. 
the, the secret sauce in the Netherlands is connecting walking and cycling infrastructure to transit. Most of their trips on bike are to transit stations. Uh, and I think that maybe that's one idea It's just, and that's not really a new idea, right? That's not groundbreaking research, but, and you're already doing it is thinking about how you can increase that connectivity between the walking and cycling network and transit. Uh, <laughs> that's the only good, good thing I can think of there because it is, that is a difficult problem. Thanks for trying. Thank you, Christine. Uh, do we have any more questions for Dave? Hey, Dave. Um, my question always is, and maybe since you are an engineer and a public health professional, you can uh, you can help shed some light on how do you really engage engineers who aren't coming at this from a public health perspective and kind of don't don't see it necessarily as their job or within their purview. You know, they see their their purpose is to move vehicles and to make sure they're minimizing congestion. And oftentimes that's actually in the city charter that that's what they're supposed to be doing. So how do you connect with them on, no, it's really more about saving lives and having a larger picture? That's <laughs> another great question. And that is something I strive to do in my career. And again, I'm not sure if I have a good answer. I, um, and that's part of why I like to start with that public health connection and say that actually engineers have been involved in public health for centuries. Um, and I, I start with safety because as you point out, they, they do have obligations, engineers do have obligations to, to minimize congestion, but I do think we do have a code of ethics in engineering that says we shouldn't be harming people <laughs> when possible. Um, and that is one E that I do think is important is thinking in terms of ethics. You talk to physicians, they have their code of ethics, which is first do no harm. Um, we may not, it may not be as, uh, prevalent in engineering, but it is true. It is, it is our job to make sure the traveling public gets to where they need to safely. Um, hopefully I've given you some tools maybe to connect with them on that. I, I do think Vision Zero and safe systems and complete streets are a good avenue, uh, a good bridge between public health and transportation. Um, but again, that's, that's another tough problem. Uh, but like I said, I start with safety and because I, I do think it's important that, yes, we have an obligation to move people, but we, we, we can't kill them in the process. <laughs> that is our responsibility. All right, thank you, Dave. Uh, okay, um, before we move on, any last questions for Dave? I have one comment. It's not necessarily for Dave, but something that um, he said regarding the street typologies. It reminded me of the work that Phoenix is working on, I believe, the key quarters master plan. And I, I'm not sure the status of it, but maybe it could be a future agenda item. I know um, Brand Fellows and Marielle Brown, who's on. So maybe just an idea of a future agenda item is the KCMP once you have more of that work completed. All right, thank you. Thank you, Omar. Oh, anyways, uh, Dave, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for joining us. Uh, great, great job. Thank you so much. Um, also, I want to thank, um, um, God, where is Neymar and Keith uh, to for their presentation today. So let's go ahead and move on to uh, item number five, uh, request for future agenda items. Um, are there any requests for uh, by the members for any future agenda items for both committees? Okay, hearing none, let's move on to item number six, uh, the adjournment. So I'll go ahead and uh, ask to uh, uh, join the um, the Active Transportation Committee meeting, and then Jason and Captain will do one the same for transit. So, um, do I have a motion to um, to adjourn the Active Transportation Committee meeting? So moved. This is Christine's okay, second. That was Justin, uh, the first, and Christine was the second. Um, do I have a do I have a I guess we're not doing we're not doing a roll call, but can I can I get a vote? All those in favor, say aye. 
Hi. Hi. Hi, Allison and all those Hi. All right, and I guess that concludes our meeting for the Atmospheric Capacitation Committee. All right. Thank you, Jose. So for the Transit Committee, we'll go ahead and close that out now. Can I get a uh, motion to adjourn? Kevin, so move. Jesus, second. All right. Okay, got a motion and a second, um, and that'll, that'll do it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you.